we're getting kind of a full court press now from, from the fossil fuel industry. There's the Keystone Pipeline, there's the Dakota Access Pipeline, there's the Pilcom Pipeline, and, and now recently we've seen this interest in increasing the shipping of, of oil. Trains are bringing in Bakken fuel oil into Albany. They're being stored there, and then they want to. And they have trains or barges bringing the fuel down to Linden, New Jersey, and Philadelphia for refining. This is going to have two pipes: one going south, one going north. Bring the crude oil down, and then bring the refined uh, kerosene, the diesel fuel, the oil back up to be sold. Pilgrim is perfectly willing to let people think that this pipeline would decrease the number of unit trains, what are called bomb trains, trains carrying Bakken crude. How does the oil get to Albany in the first place? It comes in by rail. Now initially there was a lie that Pilgrim promoted that what was going out of Albany already was 200,000 barrels a day. Well, that just happened to be the capacity of their pipeline. We started looking into it and found out that it was more like 67,000 barrels a day. Pilgrim would, would increase that to 200,000 barrels a day. Where do the trains go? They go through poor neighborhoods. Those people will be the first people to be impacted by the Pilgrim pipeline. This is not the way to go. A lot of people say that using the pipeline would be safer than having these bomb trains that could uh, derail and have a problem. My response is, neither is safe and neither is needed. Instead of investing a billion dollars in building this pipeline, invest in a renewable. I read some of the uh, comments made by the sponsors of the uh, pipeline. He said, No, my oil is not going to spill. There's no guarantees. If you look at past history, pipes have leaked. They've always leaked. If you have an oil spill, that could explode. Pipelines are risky ventures. Having a pipeline with combustible materials running north and south along our throughway, and if there was ever an incident, you know, that's, that's a serious uh, demand on our first responders and, and particularly our volunteer firemen. I don't want my volunteer firemen having to go into unsafe situations or being called uh, more often than they're already being called. There's one pipeline down in uh, Alabama right now and uh, it's, it's really dangerous, it exploded, there's a fire going on there that's uncontrollable, and it, one person was killed there, and that uh, pipeline, calling a pipeline, 178 leaks since 2006. You know, that's, so you're talking about 17.6 leaks a year. Oddly enough, the new pipelines, which are supposed to be technologically superior, seem to have a worse record than the old ones. With the Keystone Pipeline, they got like 14 major leaks in their first year of operation. With the Dakota Access Pipeline, they said in the first two years of operation, they had 200 some leaks. For the Pilgrim Pipeline, there's gonna be a major leak every two and a half years, somewhere up and down the Hudson Valley. That's just the way it's gonna be. The Pipeline and Hazardous Substance Material Agency regulates pipeline safety to the extent they can. They're hugely understaffed. They can't really patrol pipelines. They go in and look at a pipeline leak that was reported to them by the pipeline company. They don't even get their own data. The only data they get is reported by the pipelines. They said, we realize we have a problem with our data when our regulated organization is the one reporting data to us. You think? And this is a 178 mile pipe. If you're monitoring the whole thing, it's a different story, but you don't monitor the whole thing. It's just a way for them to make additional money with uh, less overhead. So if there's a leak somewhere, by the time you get to it, a lot of the oil is going to be gone. If it's by the watershed, it's going to be washed down the river. If it's in the ground, it's going to be seeped into the ground. The uh, resource you see around here is the Hudson River. I mean, that's, that's a major resource. Towns downstream use Hudson, some of Hudson River water as, uh, as their drinking water. So any kind of contamination that takes place here or anywhere along that pipeline is going to be spread downstream. 28 towns and villages that the pipeline is going to go through, and 23 of them have voted not to allow it to go through. And yet, that's not going to stop them.
Every town should have home rule to decide whether they want that pipeline to go through or not. There's a person up in Greene County who was contacted by a Pilgrim Pipeline to uh, lease her land as an access, to allow access roads to be built into, into her land to uh, get to the pipeline where they want to build a pipeline. She refused. She thinks there's a procedure going on where they're going to take her to court and have her land condemned by eminent domain so they can utilize that land. Eminent domain allows the federal government to take land away from people for better usage. In other words, they used eminent domain to build all the interstates, you know, and they gave fair compensation. All of a sudden now, eminent domain is being used by corporations saying that right now this land is not being used, there's no taxes on it, there's no money being generated. If we are allowed to use the pipeline here, we are generating taxes, we are generating jobs and so forth, and therefore it's benefiting the community and the state. It kind of takes away the individual person's right to keep the land. The intention of eminent domain was for government, not to make money, but to, to uh, benefit the community through an infrastructure. Not this way. People should have the right on their land to do what they want to do. If the government wants to come in there and say, I want to build a road here or an infrastructure here, they'll benefit all of the people here. That's a different story. But to benefit a corporation, that's not the same story. You know, we don't think that's in the best interest of our community from an economic perspective, from an environmental perspective, from a public health perspective. But how do you make that argument come across with a little more fervor? I, I really feel like this is exactly the way you make an argument against this type of project. There was a investment manager that's a publicly traded company out of Los Angeles called Aries, and they have a, a variety of different investment strategies across asset classes, geographies, and our pension fund in New York State had nearly $800 million, almost a billion dollars of the 184 was invested via Aries. And when you hire a firm to manage your money, you pay them. We pay them nearly $9 million a year in management fees. But you also generally pay them an incentive fee based on portfolio performance. So you know, I think that there's probably other money that Aries is, is benefiting from by managing this money on behalf of our pension fund. We're commending the governor's office for their reforming the energy vision initiative, commonly referred to as REV. You know, that includes reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the energy sector by 80% from 1990 levels by the year 2050. The other, the other key takeaway, the goal of sourcing 50% of all of New York's electricity generation from renewables by 2020. We're saying you, you gotta be mindful of the, the governor's reforming the energy vision initiative when you're making portfolio company decisions or uh, portfolio company manager decisions. A great member of our coalition who came up with the idea of, of just writing Aries management, saying, we know you, you want to do the right thing, and, and you probably don't realize what a negative thing this pipeline is, and it's against, you know, harmful to the environment, potentially really a disaster, and we're, we're sure once you realize that, you'll want to withdraw your funds, and they sent a letter back basically saying, we're not really interested in, in your opinion. Uh, Aries was apparently oblivious to our activity in the New York area. We're supporting the governor's rev initiative. And we're also highlighting the fact that the comptroller's office has a history of being a proactive comptroller. The New York State comptroller is the administrative head of the retirement system. And as fiduciary, the comptroller acts in the best interest of the system's members and retirees. If you were just to be a passive investor and only invest in an index fund, you would end up with you know, X percent of big pharma, X percent of, you know, big financial services, X percentage of fossil fuel related companies. So it would be hard to be comfortable with the passive approach to investing. We're asking the, the comptroller's office to, you know, do what they're good at. You know, we are not just a 
passive investor. Our pension fund is not just a passive investor that's saying, well, our, our sole mandate is to achieve the, the, the best returns. That is not the sole mandate. It's really important that we have activists who talk about you know, the health risks, the environmental risks, and say we need to you know, correct behavior because it's the right thing to do. But I also really like the idea of, of being solution-oriented. Different people have different skill sets and there's different ways to approach this issue and, and express concern. If we limit global warming to two degrees in the next 50 years, we can only use 20% of the known oil reserves. If we use any more, then we're going to go over that limit. And the international panel decided to set the limit for 1.5 degrees. So even lower than that. So that tells you right there that we're coming to the end of the fossil fuel era. That it's a declining energy resource. So it points out the folly of investing in fossil fuel infrastructure at all. You know, we, we are so far behind. We are so far behind. The technology for renewable energy came from the U.S., but we're not utilizing it. We gotta get smart. We're the only country in the world that doesn't discuss climate crisis. Every other country discusses it. Why not? Why are we not going that route? And the reason being very simply is because the, uh, the biggest industry in this country is big oil. They own a lot of congressmen. Why doesn't the governor just say, mm -mm, like he did for fracking? It would save the government a lot of work, you know? It would save the government a lot of resources to do that. And God knows it would save us a lot of work, too. I had a woman standing beside me who had never participated in any activism, any environmental activity before. And she said that she decided it was time. She had to go out and make a stand. And uh, it just warms my heart to see that. People are realizing that they're, we're gonna, all going to have to do it ourselves. It's going to be a mass political movement. That's really the power, actually, we have, is, is affecting change in the government. And we can affect change in the government by expanding awareness and by petitioning the government. And if you do that enough, you can get the government to change. Create a buzz, a large conversation going. The more it's repeated that the pipelines would represent a danger and a threat to our community, to our health, to our drinking water, to our beautiful Hudson Valley, the better our chance of success will be. If we band together and stay committed and stay strong, we can do this. The little thing that Margaret Mead said, she said, never doubt that a small group of well-informed, committed people can change the world. Indeed, that's the way it has always been. But the tree hadn't died. Oh